and in uh, celebration of uh, Te Tiwiki or Te Reo Māori, um, so kia ora, uh, kia ora koutou, ko uh, Sutton to ko Fana, ko Joe to ko Ingwa, ko Birkin Head uh, Ho. So that's just my very simple um, attempt at Te Reo for in, in honour of uh, Tiwiki or Te Reo Māori, which is... Sure. You know, I reckon in, in a few years to come that won't be unusual, which will be fantastic. And for those of us that did not learn to speak to them as children, it's a big yeah. challenge, isn't it? So I just try to learn one or two words here or there and get more confident as the days go by. Um, right, so I'm Jo. Um, I work full, well I don't work full time, I, I get paid to work 25 hours a week at Autism New Zealand and I that. Yeah, but I do that because I'm absolutely passionate about supporting our community, supporting parents and um, caregivers in particular. That's my 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 biggest passion, um, and that probably comes out of a place that I'm a mum. I have a I have three children, and my oldest Fergus is 16 and was diagnosed with autism at age five. Um, he is doing fantastically well. Um, Mum, not so much at the moment because he's about to leave school and that's mm -hmm. and head off to uni tech next year, which is a really um, amazing yet yeah, freaky time for us as a family as our boy launches out into the big wide world. Doesn't feel like he's old enough to be doing that yet, but anyway. Um, I also I work across a couple of teams at Autism New Zealand. So I'm embedded within the education team, so that means that I get to fly to exotic places like New Plymouth and Palmerston North to yeah. deliver autism education. And I also provide additional support and training to our outreach team, who are a wonderful group of people around the country in 16 different branches who are working directly with our autism and autistic community. And um, I get I get handed those cases that are deemed a little bit tricky or a little bit high in complex needs for the um, main skill set of that team of people. So um, it's a real privilege to do what I do. I get to work with people at some really difficult times in their life, um, times of crisis, um, share their celebrations when things go well. Um, and um, join them in their sadness when things don't go so well and perhaps uh, our system here in New Zealand lets them down for one reason or another. It's far from perfect, but there's lots of amazing people out there working really hard in this space. Right, so let's start with a computer that works would be really good. Okay. We like to start with terminology because, as I think you would probably all agree, our words hold great power. There's probably a scripture somewhere about that, wouldn't there be? Yeah. Um, if I think about it. But our words do hold great power. We have the ability to build people up with our words. We have the ability to knock them down. You know? um, and so I'm just going to shut this door. Yes. Yes. I can just feel the room. Sorry, I'll, I'll leave the little ether on the side. That's sure. all right. Um, years ago at Autism New Zealand we knew that terminology was starting to change, that the community was starting to speak to us about how they wanted autism talked about and discussed. And for most of us that have been in the sector for a long time or in the disability sector, we would have used terminology like a person with autism, like a person in a wheelchair. Um, but the, the work that we did with the community and with, in consultation really clearly told us that for the most part, people see autism as part of their identity. Autism is the wiring in our brains, and people saw that as an integral part of them. Not as, it's not a disease, not as something that you want to cure or fix, um, and it's not something that they carry around with them. It's very much a part of who they are. Mm. So we settled on identity first languaging, which is a great place to be. We're people focused, we're more interested in the person than in this condition. So you will hear me say um, autistic person, autistic adult, autistic individual. Now the tricky bit comes in that we're all on a different stage in that journey and when you talk to individuals they might communicate their neurodiversity differently. 
So you might have people in my generation who are diagnosed with Asperger's or Asperger's syndrome. These days, autism is autism is autism. There's no Asperger's, there's no, there's a whole lot of other acronyms and things that we used to talk about. Nowadays, autism is autism is autism, and we prefer to talk about somebody's support needs rather than levels. We do see diagnostic reports that say level one, two, or three, but they're not particularly helpful, and I'll explain a little bit about that next. Um, at the end of the day, however, it's just really important that we are using the terminology that the person in front of us prefers. That's just you know respecting each individual's um, with will. Um, when I talked about it with my son, so Fergus was about 14 when this uh, terminology resource came out, and I said to him, well, you know, buddy, how would you like me to describe your autism? Are you Fergus and you're autistic, or are you Fergus and I have autism? And he just went kind of, ugh, like a 14 year old <laughs> boy might, <laughs> and walked away. And I pushed him a little bit further, and I said, no, yeah, this is really important. I really need to know how you want me to talk about your autism. And he turned around to me, and in that classic way that only an autistic young man can do, um, he just looked at me back faced and he said, just call me Fergus and walked away. <laughs> kind of illustrating a point there. You know, it's, it's actually not that important to him. For some people, it is really important. Now, wave at me and put your hand up if you've heard people say things like, oh, we're all on the spectrum somewhere. You know oh, that? Yes. Yeah. Um, what else do people say? Oh, I'm a little bit autistic. We hear those kind of things, and the absolute reality is that to be autistic, you have to fulfill some pretty definitive diagnostic criteria. Um, and I'm not going to go into that, because we could spend all day talking about that criteria. But for an autistic person that might see autism as part of their identity of who they are, um, for us then to sort of say, well, we're all a little bit autistic, um, is a little bit disrespectful. Um, and even you could go to so far as to say, um, I don't know, um, no, I've lost it, brain's not there tonight. But you know, you know where I'm going with this. The other thing is that we kind of talk about people being very autistic or just a little bit autistic. Oh, he's, he's, he's very mild, he's very high functioning. You hear that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. You know, talking about someone that would previously have been diagnosed with Asperger's. So someone with quite good communication skills, when I think about an Aspie or a person with Asperger's, um, they're typically quite quirky. Um, they've usually got some very intense interests. They might speak slightly differently, kind of you meet people who are very formal. Um, you meet these sorts of people, my autism radar goes off all the time <laughs> because I seem to attract those people into my life probably because I value them and I'm fascinated by them and I am open to them. So I can be in the middle of the bush somewhere, I like to go tramping, literally true story, middle of the bush, hadn't seen anyone all day, came across a couple, we got chatting, and my husband was getting a bit antsy, he liked to keep going, and as we walked away after a great chat, he said to me, oh gosh, we got all the way to the middle of the bush and we still managed to find some of your people. <laughs> So um, you do come across those people from time to time, amazing, cool people, but not a little bit autistic, not very autistic. And I know that you're sitting here thinking, well, oh, what about my cousin's son who's non-verbal? And okay, let me explain that a little bit for you. Autism is not linear. Autism is more like what you see here, a beautiful pick and mix or a lucky dip of traits of strengths, of challenges, language and communication, sensory differences and how the person mm. will um, interpret and perceive and interpret uh, sensory information around their perception of the world um, and lots of other things. Now the important thing to note is that that can change on a daily, hourly or minutely basis depending on the environment that the person is in. So you might meet somebody who's very verbally communicative, very articulate,
articulate. But if they're faced with a situation which is very um, scary for them or um, something they're very anxious about, you might find that their ability to communicate is diminished or goes completely. You might meet somebody who, imagine that door. If I um, was autistic, I might have found that cold air coming on me almost painful. I might have found that I can't, can't concentrate on anything else because I can't filter out the sound of that projector or the heat pump. And we'll talk more about um, sensory further on here. And that can vary as well according to how I am on the day, um, what's going on around me. So, um, high and low functioning, no such thing. The really important thing to note is that when we talk about someone being high functioning, we're actually doing them a major disservice. Because what we're describing is how we are experiencing their autism, not how they experience the world. And that's really tricky because they might be working really, really hard to look normal, to behave normal, to cope, to fit in. And I imagine here at the community of St. Luke, we probably have a real strong emphasis on phenomenatana, mm. on belonging. You would be right, I'm making massive assumptions, but because I, I know what a church family feels like, your ideal would be that the minute someone walked in the door here, they feel like they belong. Mm. That'd be a fair yeah, assumption. Absolutely. Yeah. And the difficulty when we are saying, well, they're very high functioning, you know, we're basically expecting them just to fit in which is not belonging. The opposite to belonging is fitting in. So mm -hmm. just keep that in mind. And then you might have somebody that has very, very high support needs. And we might describe them as low functioning or severe autistic. Now, here's a couple of things to think about. Mm -hmm. Just because someone can't speak does not mean they can't think. And we're not talking about an intellectual disability here, although there are some autistic people who do have an intellectual disability as a co-occurring condition. For the most part, um, most autistic people don't have that intellectual or cognitive um, difficulty. It's just that their language, the, the, the bit between the brain and the ability to speak has developed differently. So just because they can't speak does not mean they can't think. And I have met many, many people to back that up who have just an incredible view on the world. Cannot speak, cannot write, but put them in front of the computer and watch what they can do. Mm. Amazing. So we really want to be focusing on a person's strengths, what they love. Why is that not working? Probably because I'm pointing it at the screen and not the computer. Mm. Um, what we want to be doing is approaching this thing called autism and neurodiversity. Actually, let's jump back a wee bit. Neurodiversity. Anyone got a, any idea about what neurodiversity is all about? Anyone got any clues? Anything that's not neurotypical. Yeah, okay. Well, that's absolutely it. Yeah. I, I just I, I understood it as, as people, people have a different way of thinking and experiencing the world. Absolutely. And it, and it, a whole lot of <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we're all human and that's the wonderful thing about all of us. Now, if we're going to get into the true definitions, neurodiversity, we are all neuro neurodiverse. Not a single one of us is wired the same because we all have different genes, genetic makeup, values, beliefs, experiences, all that kind of stuff. And that all goes towards forming this incredible thing in our heads we call our brain. Now, neurodivergent is a person whose brain is wired differently. Someone whose brain is different from that which is considered typical or neurotypical, if that makes any sense. So within neurodivergent, we've got things like autism, ADHD, Tourette's syndrome, um, we have even epilepsy fits into there, anxiety disorders, um, some people have had early childhood trauma, which has um, changed how their brains have developed, all that kind of stuff. So it's pretty big. Um, I'm not particularly interested in diagnoses. 
I'm more interested in the person, in their strengths, um, in what lights up their eyes, why they get out of bed in the morning. That's the same for anybody I meet. So if we come at autism and neurodiversity from the social model, not the medical model, and the medical model is this really ghastly thing, one of the ways that we diagnose autism, called the diagnostic, uh, the, um, the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. Mm. I don't think I want to be listed in there. <laughs> it doesn't sound too good, does it? Um, but it's, it's DSM-5 for short, version 5. Now, the medical model of autism talks a lot about deficits. It talks about deficits in social communication. It talks about repetitive behaviours and um, restricted interests. And it's got all these really negative connotations. If we come at it from the social model, what we're doing is looking at the, the whole person in that really holistic way. Um, we are then going to, we're going to start in that place where we're looking at their strengths. Um, we're going to be looking at the things that they love and the things that they can do. That's always a great place to start. Um, and then we're going to take a look at the barriers that there might be uh, to their full participation in life to them living their best life. That's all we could ever wish and hope for, right, is to live our best lives. Um, and we can then start looking at how we could support that person, how we could accommodate their needs, how we can change, and this is when it gets really interesting. Because it's not about this person over here who has an autism diagnosis or ADHD or like so many of our young people these days, autism and ADHD, it's quite a lot to carry around, um, we're actually going to be thinking about how we can change and how we can adapt and adapt the environment to suit their needs. The cool thing about the social model is it actually looks at the whole community and goes, we need these people, we need these out-of-the-box thinkers, we need these creative brains and these people that have black and white thinking and will not be told to stop if they've got a good idea. Because, you know, like him or love him, the people like Elon Musk's of this world are neurodivergent. And those brains come up with some pretty astounding ideas at times. Um, look, not all autistic people are incredible inventors and creatives, but spend a couple of minutes with an autistic person and I can just about guarantee you'll come away with some sort of wow, you know, because for every area they might have challenges, they're going to have somewhere else that they excel and they will blow your mind. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk more about that later. I heard it again, look, you wouldn't want me to like tap my head and <laughs> here we go. I mentioned, I touched on sensory. Now, I call sensory the low-hanging fruit of autism understanding and support. What you need to know, this um, if I was with you for a full day or two days, which is what our programs normally are, we would take you through a whole lot of um, really fun activities and we talk through some analogies um, to help demonstrate some of this. But what you need to know from this little um, graphic here is that the autistic brain is more focused on the sensory information it receives than the social. Remember that deficits in social communication? It starts to make a whole lot of sense to you when you understand some of the research that's coming out, and actually not just recently, a guy called Annie Klin was responsible for this little bit of research about sensory social orientation. Mm -hmm. My brain is very focused on the social side of communication and the world. I'm looking around the room, I'm interpreting your body language, your facial gestures, all that kind of thing. I would learn pretty quickly if you're all falling asleep or if you had a certain facial expression that perhaps you weren't agreeing with me um, or that I'd said something that had offended you. I can tell if you're happy and you know, you're finding it all very interesting and engaging. You do little nods and little smiles and things like that. Now, for a lot of autistic people, they don't pick up on 
body language, facial expressions, those sorts of things, the nod of your head, the gentle twitch of your cheek. Um, they, their brains are picking up on the sensory information. So the lights, the sounds, the tactile, the things they touch. Um, one thing you need to know about autistic people is if they tell you it's too loud, too bright, too, no you know, too noisy, too uncomfortable, you better pay attention because they can experience uh, sensory information in a very profound way often. They can be very, very high registering of sensory information, mm -hmm. i.e. a light coming in through the window might be actually physically painful for them. Um, some of our colleagues will talk about how they can hear the electricity through the walls in the office. I mean, you can sit back and go, whatever, you know, I don't can hear the electricity. But when you say that in a room and three or four autistic people go, oh, I can too! And you go, really? Seriously? You can hear the currents of the electricity? Amazing. Yeah. The difficulty is that all the stuff is coming at them all at once plus all the social communication stuff that's really, really tricky. So it's really, really hard for them to filter stuff out and to be able to pay attention. If you see an autistic person looking away from you, it's not perhaps because they're being rude, but they might find eye contact incredibly challenging, or they may be able to concentrate better if they're not looking at you. Mm -hmm. If you see an autistic person pacing around at the back of church, it's not because they're rude or bored. They actually might have a need for that movement and they concentrate better when they're moving. Hmm. So that's just some, some of the real basics. But be, be thinking about your five senses when you're with an autistic person and if you want to be sensitive to their needs and they look uncomfortable or look distressed, sensory is a really good one to check out. Hmm. Is it too cold? Are you too hot? Is this a good place to sit? You know, that kind of thing. Unex if you see some unexpected behaviours, sensory is a good one to check in because we can easily accommodate that kind of stuff. Does that all make sense? Anyone got any questions about sensory? That's, a, that's an interesting, I think that's a very helpful way. I didn't quite thought it made sense, I didn't quite thought of it like that. I've, I've got a couple of friends, I don't know if it's quite fitting in with this talk about. Um, autistic people, but they talk about the need to distract themselves to help listen, etc. So that's, it's, it's quite an ADHD trait, that one. Yeah. So it's an ADHD person, and they generally have developed some really amazing mm. skills at being able to concentrate. Yeah, and so the, the normal expectation about you know getting someone's full attention, you know, if you're mm. expecting in a class or a group yeah. or something, yeah. And of course, if someone's looking distracted or is busy on their computer or something, on their phone. Yeah. no, 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 shut that and then come back in. Well, it, it's interesting that, it, that that can be the way that actually helps the person to. That's it. right. It gives us a whole different launch pad of understanding, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, because we make assumptions that if someone is bashing around their laptop when you're talking to them, that they're not concentrating, they're not engaging with you but actually it might be what that person needs to be able to concentrate and engage better. So, you know, when you put a lens of neurodiversity across things, honestly, it's made me such a better person. I'm so much more understanding of other people, you know. And instead of applying judgment, if I see someone doing something odd in the supermarket, I no longer default to that, oh my gosh, what are they doing, what a weirdo. Um, I now go, gee, God, I wonder what that brain, what's going on in that brain? You know, because I now see it through this amazing lens of neurodiversity and nothing surprised, well, every so often something will come across my desk and I'll go, oh, never heard that one before. But nothing really surprises me anymore. The other thing to hold really firmly to is that there is no such thing as autistic behaviours. I'll leave that one with you for a second. There is no such thing as autistic behaviours because the behaviours that we see in an autistic person are simply human behaviours. It's just they might happen at unexpected times mm. or they might be out of kilter with our perception of how a person of that age or experience might um, communicate 
or interact with the world. So human behaviours. Um, if you know anything about anxiety in the brain, neuroscience, which, oh darn, I, I try not to have regrets in life, but if I could roll things back 20 years, I'd go back to university and do a degree in psychology and probably head into neuroscience because I'm fascinated with this incredible thing in our heads and how humans respond to different situations like stress, fear, all that kind of stuff. And what you need to know about autistic people is that it's understood that the nervous system, the central nervous system of an autistic person is highly activated all the time. We expect autistic people to live in a world, a crazy chaotic world that was never designed for the neurodivergent brain. It's designed for all of us that can cope with change and you know, all that kind of stuff. And so a lot of our autistic people live every day of their lives with their anxiety levels up around eye level level. Mm -hmm. Mine are kind of down here, and the stresses of day-to-day -day life, you know, kids, family, work, kind of go like this, and I have strategies to be able to cope, mm -hmm. and for the most part, all levels. But if you're living with anxiety levels, if your central nervous system is so activated that the slightest change or um, you know, a little bit of added stress mm -hmm. could cause you to flip your lid. And we see that, we see autistic people, they reach the end of their ability to cope, the end of their social emotional resources and the lid flips. Mm -hmm. And we see adults having meltdowns, shutdowns, all that kind of thing. Right, walking right along, just touching a little on communication. I talked about facial expressions, body language, all that kind of stuff. But the other thing to think about is your voice, your tone, the modulation, the way you speak, your volume, all that kind of stuff. You will get a lot of information from me from all of that stuff, my voice, my tone. Imagine if I came out of a movie and I said to you, ah, oh, that was a great movie, versus coming out of, the, out of a different movie and saying, well, that was a great movie. Two completely opposite meanings, same words. The first one, loved it, great movie, best movie I've ever seen. The second one, sarcasm, oh, that was a great movie. You know, that's two hours of my life I'm not going to get back. The difficulty for an autistic person is that they often cannot interpret that voice and that tone. Sarcasm is based upon tone. So if a person is getting most of the meaning from the words that you are using, you better choose your words very carefully. And I tell you what, with everything that I know, I still trip up talking to autistic people sometimes. Last Friday I had a family meeting on Zoom, um, supporting this beautiful young man. He's 16 years old, he's been going so well at college, he's a really smart kid. I've never had any problems. He's autistic, he has what he calls his social interpreter at school that he goes to and asks questions like, what did they mean when they said that? Because he can't interpret kind of that teenage social communication. Gosh, most of us can't either. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but he has a social interpreter and he's been going really well. But one day, things just mounted up for him and he got really, really stressed. Um, uh, his nemesis, a girl that's always caused him a little bit of a problem, um, said something to him and he took exception, pushed her up against the wall and broke a window. And unfortunately, schools being schools, couldn't see past the end of their nose and they expelled him first time around. My heart was breaking for him because he just didn't deserve that kind of cut off. He deserved a whole lot more understanding. Anyway, we opened the Zoom meeting and I said, oh, let's just call him Adam. Hey Adam. Um, I'm Jo, and how are you feeling right now? No, I said, how are you feeling? Because it's been a bit tough for you lately. And he said, what, like yesterday or right now? You know, be really careful with your words. And I asked him several more questions, and I had to really think, because this guy's a black and white thinker, and how you say it is how it is. And I had to explain things really, really carefully to him. I also slowed down my communication because I tend to talk quite quick. 
exactly. <laughs> um, so for our autistic community, for me, communication is easy. I can pretty well most of the time pick up on what people are trying to tell me or what they're trying to communicate with me. Um, but for our autistic community, it can be a bit more like a game of chess, a really complicated game of chess when they're trying to figure out all of these layers of social communication, the hidden curriculum. Anyone have any idea of what the hidden curriculum might be? What's, what's behind um, the obvious or the yeah. front of you? Yes, definitely. Yeah. You know how sometimes we're not perfectly honest mm -hmm. and we say things. Mm -hmm. Here's a classic. Um, when you're in the supermarket and you see someone that's like, not quite a friend, more of an acquaintance. And the hidden curriculum is that person would probably walk past you and acknowledge you and say something. So we're Kiwis going, Hi, how are, you do how are you doing? I haven't seen you for ages. And then, oh, good to see you, and you keep walking, right? That's kind of the known mm. thing that we've just learned that we do. But if you don't understand the hidden curriculum, and the person says, Hi, how are you doing? You might say, Oh, I've had such a bad week. You won't believe it, the cat died, my uncle hit the fence, and da 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 da, and this, suddenly this person is giving you a whole life story, and that's not quite what they were after, and it's very <laughs> uncomfortable. That's the hidden curriculum. Now, for an autistic person, I've heard them say, but that's lying if you just say, oh, I'm, I'm good, good to see you, thanks, you know, and keep walking, if you're not feeling good to them, that's lying. So you can see how it gets a little bit tricky. But the hidden curriculum, you know, we learn the appropriate things to do or say or act right through our lives if we're well supported by wonderful family, friends and whanau, you know. Um, so we've learned these skills and for some of our autistic people they haven't. So sometimes conversation can be a bit tricky with an autistic person. They might ask you something that you're like, oh, you've been asked that before, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, you know, I've had an autistic person come up to me and say, so what did happen to your eye? <laughs> you know, and you just kind of go, oh, okay. <laughs> That's all right, I'll be the grown-up now. Um, so, you know, they're not trying to be offensive. They're not trying to be rude. They're just curious like the rest of us, and sometimes they haven't learned filter, and they haven't learned that hidden curriculum. So it's also part of the reason I like autistic people so much. Do not ever say to an autistic person, if you've bought a new pair of hats, does my bum look big in this? <laughs> Unless you are ready for it. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> Absolutely true. Um, and the cool thing about that is when we're focusing on strengths, truth and honesty is one of the strengths that you will definitely encounter in an autistic person. And I think we have to value that, right? Yeah. Okay, now, um, one of the analogies that we use at Autism New Zealand to help explain how life might be for a neurodivergent person and how we can support them is through this thing called the Autism New Zealand Seesaw. You can also think about it a bit like an old-fashioned balance scale. You know what I'm talking about there? So, let's just have a think about all of us. Um, how many of you have like your favourite pair of pants or your favourite pair of shoes? Mm. Yeah, we do, right? What about, you know, for most mornings for breakfast, do you tend to eat the same thing or ish? Yes. Yeah? Um, if there were two ways to drive here tonight, would you have probably gone the same way as you went last time? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think we're pretty happy that we're all creatures of habit. Yeah. And creatures of habit sit at the end of the seesaw, and that's certain. The things that are known to us, predictable, the things we like, the things we're comfortable with. However, those of us that consider ourselves neurotypical, we get pretty bored if things stay the same. So if I said to you, you're only going to have wheat mix for the next 365 days, you might reel against that and go, no, oh, can we change it out a little bit? You know, like a bit of variety there. Um, for the most part, I'm a little bit of a creature of habit, but when I go away on holiday, I want to go somewhere new try something new, experience something new. You do meet those people who have gone to the same caravan at the same holiday park for 30 years, and I sit there quietly going, bigger they're autistic. <laughs> um, but that's quite mean and judgmental. But, um, 
you know, that does seem seem to fit with the um, needs of an autistic person to be functioning at this end of the seesaw. Um, but you and I, for the most part, can cope with change, small changes. If things get too changey, we get a bit antsy. Think about COVID. Mm. Think about how our whole community was challenged on that change front, you know. Suddenly we're not at work, we're not out in the community, we can't do our groceries the way that we used to, we're stuck in our little houses, um, we all started rallying against that change and we saw some pretty big things happen at community level. When I looked at all that stuff that was happening down in Wellington, I put my lens of neurodiversity across that and went, well, you know, there's a whole lot of people that we've just tilted their seesaw really badly into that uncertain, changeable, unpredictable, you know. I've lost my job. When am I going to be able to go back to work? Human mm. beings, this is human behaviour. Mm. However, I can manage with my life is doing, you know, the world's not perfect, right? We get thrown a curveball multiple times in a day. You're driving to work and there's a roadworks and so you have to go a different direction. We can readjust, we can, you know, recalibrate and manage with that. We might have a little kind of mumble, a little curse under our breath, but we get on with it, it has, doesn't ruin our day. Um, you know, we, we can cope with change. We could walk in here this evening, you're expecting all the chairs, and someone's put them in another room, and it's a bit of inconvenience, something that you weren't expecting, but you can cope with that. We go, okay, what's the worst that can happen? Might be a little bit late starting, but we can cope with that. For our autistic people, they prefer to be here. Think about that central nervous system, and it's very activated. Mm -hmm. Change things that I'm not sure about, things I'm uncertain about, they cause increased anxiety, fear, and distress. So you will find that autistic people will ear towards the center of the seesaw. Same, same, predictable, routine structure. Start thinking about church. Church provides <laughs> rituals. Same, same, structure. Things I know, things that are predictable. When I have a, when we have a church service, these things happen in an order. And there's things on the wall telling us what we're going to sing and who's going to speak next. And we do all sorts of wonderful things like that. Mm you probably find that a lot of autistic people are quite attracted to the church environment because of that. Um, I have a bit of a side gig at Scouts Aotearoa as their National Diversity and Inclusion Advisor. And I believe, uh, we don't have any stats um, on how many autistic and neurodivergent people we have at, at Scouts, but having just sat through three days of hui with them in Wellington at senior leadership level, I'm thinking it's about half the population of scouts mm -hmm. has, if they're not autistic or ADHD themselves, they have children who are autistic or ADHD. Mm -hmm. Or they know somebody, or they have a leaning towards working with people like that. Because just like church, scouts has rituals, routines, mm -hmm. structure, predictability. Mm -hmm. So, that's that end of the seesaw. But life, this crazy world we live in, kind of works down this end of unpredictable. We don't know how long things are going to go for. We don't know, um, we don't know what kind of government we're going to have in a few months' time. Unpredictable. All of those things are very, very difficult for an auto autistic person to manage because they function best when things are same, same, predictable and certain. So it starts to explain some unexpected behaviours when you see a person who's not coping with change. If they came in expecting the chocolate Tim Tams and all you've got is Griffin's Krispies, you might see some unexpected behaviours there and that answers some of those questions. So to be able to support our autistic community as best as we can, we want to be thinking about those situations that might tilt the seesaw and work out how we can tilt it back into that place of same, same, predictable. And that's around a lot of letting people know, if I'm thinking about your environment here, 
letting people know what's happening and when, who's going to be there, you know, give them as much information as possible. And I call it the four W's and the H. What, why, when, who, and how. If you can provide that in advance, that anxiety will come down. I'm in control, I understand what's going to happen, I can cope with change. So being able to predict, having a routine, having a structure. For families, the first thing I ask them is, what's your routine like at home? You know, if that child doesn't know what's for dinner or what time dinner is going to be, and you know, um, the bedroom is chaos. No one has helped him clean up the mess because he actually can't because he wants to tidy up his room but he can't because he's got ADHD as well and he just gets a bit stuck in that executive functioning, the stringing all the jobs together and getting the job done is what we call it in our house. It's, you know, Come on, mate, focus, get the job done. Mm -hmm. um, that can be really challenging for someone who has autism or ADHD. Mm -hmm. So think about the seesaw whenever you're approaching, when you're dealing with a situation where you know, I think this person might be autistic or they've told you they're autistic. How can we support them around sensory and around change, predictability, providing something that's certain? And if you've got someone asking you 10,000 questions, it's probably a pretty good indication of where they're at emotionally. So does that make a, a little bit of sense? Have I got yeah. little slides here? Oh, here we go. So there we go. This is our tool that we use to support the change in the environment. Um, and you know, like my beautiful boy down in Wellington there that got expelled from school, all the teachers saw was the behaviour. Nobody stopped and asked why. Mm. And I get that with parents as well. You know, we get quite focused on the behaviour. Or if something goes wrong in a group here at church, um, you know, someone behaves in a certain way or storms out or, um, you know, in a workplace environment, I had someone storm into a meeting and spill out all her concerns and then storm out again. <laughs> um, I absolutely knew what was going on because I'm looking at the why behind that, not the behaviour. Mm. The behaviour is just what you see. So if you're thinking all the time, why is this happening? Why did they behave like that? Why did they respond or interact in that way? Rather than focusing on the behavior, um, we stand a better chance of being able to prevent, mitigate that behavior happening again, or being able to support the person if we know the why behind it in the first place. Quite often I get people ringing me going, my child's doing this and I really need some strategies. And I, you can almost hear them go, uh -huh, when I say to them, okay, let's just unpack that a little bit and see what might be the reasons why your child is behaving that way. Because in the um, light of every single human being is different, I could throw 10 autism strategies at them and none of those will work mm. because I actually haven't got to the, the core reason behind the issue in the first place and all we're doing is chucking a band-aid on it or actually mm -hmm. making it worse, causing more anxiety and fear and distress. Mm. It's probably very congruent with what you said earlier about they're all human behaviours but maybe mm -hmm. getting expressed in time. Yeah, absolutely. You think about, you know, a three year old um, throwing their toys around in frustration and anger and we just think that's cute or mm -hmm. you know, three, we'll just give them a little bit of understanding. But unfortunately, if an autistic person isn't supported around the reasons why they're throwing their toys around, um, at 15, and they're still behaving like that, uh, becomes really scary. Mm -hmm. At 18, that in front of restorative justice trust who I was working with just recently, mm -hmm. same behavior, nothing has changed for that person. They're still unable to emotionally regulate, and the way that they express that fear, anxiety, distress is by throwing things at 18. That's broken windows, black eyes, mm. um, laptops getting thrown across the room, and you know flat screen TVs. The families go through them like three a year, mm. you know, which is terrifying. So um, it's really, really important that we take a big, deep breath when we're looking at autism and thinking, you know, let's take it right back to the basics. What does this person need in this moment or in the greater sense to have their, their needs supported?
Now the challenging thing is when you're faced with an autistic adult, as I'm often faced with, I do like quite a lot of work within residential care, and that I find a little bit, it's sort of 50% heartwarming because there's some incredible people working in those spaces. You have to be a pretty amazing human being to be doing that kind of work. Um, but they are working with some very complex human beings mm. who haven't learnt those pivotal capacities for learning mm. right back here that we would normally learn at three, four, five, uh, turn to <coughs> sharing, joint attention. They haven't developed or learned or been taught, been taught those skills. And now they're a 35-year-old autistic man and they are kind of stuck in rigid patterns of behaviour. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very difficult for some of those care workers to be able to help you know, the person mm -hmm. out this end. So what we know about autism on a bright night is that the earlier that we can identify autism in our kids and ADHD, the better the life outcomes are likely to be for that person. Because if we can come in really early on, with the things that they need to be supported in. It might be a speech and language therapist to support their language development and you know, um, interaction. It might be an occupational therapist to sort of address some of their sensory differences. It might be a behaviour specialist to come in and help mum and dad or caregivers to help understand some of the behaviours. Mm. Um, the earlier we can do that, support them into their journey in school and through school, then what's popping out the other end are some pretty incredible human beings. So that's not to say there's still people that will be non-speaking, um, you know, have lots of challenges in life um, because we don't really understand all the genetics and neurology behind autism yet, but it's very clear in the evidence that if we can get in there early. So there are tools if you've got family members that are questioning and thinking, oh, I think my child is a bit different, do get in touch because I can put you in touch with a couple of you know, apps and things like that mm -hmm. where you can do early observations and that's as early as 18 months old these days, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So we're diagnosing wow. earlier and earlier. The other thing, because I could talk about this all night. <laughs> Am I going for time? I must be well over 25. Uh, yeah, 25 past that, yeah. I was being diagnosed than ever before. Now, some of the reasons behind that is that the diagnostic criteria for autism is based on presentation in an eight-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And it was designed 45 years ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. autism in women and girls can look very, very different. And often girls tend to be more social creatures. So in those early years of childhood, it's not that noticeable. They often are labeled as highly anxious or socially anxious girls, quirky girls, creative girls. Um, they often get diagnosed with an anxiety disorder at about eight, nine, 10. Um, what happens and what we're seeing increasingly is when the social communication demands kick in, around adolescence and teenage years, the wheels often fall off for the girls. Where they've been able to do that beautiful fitting in, looking like I'm normal in, you know, um, what do you call it? Oh, for goodness sake, Joe, my brain, this time of night, not used to talking this time. Um, inverted commas, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, quote, unquote, there we go. Normal, what is normal anyway? Um, these girls start to become increase, increasingly difficult for them to mask and camouflage um, their autistic traits. Mum and dad go, whoa, what's going, what's happening here? And often that girl will go off and get a diagnosis and she receives an autism diagnosis. And we're seeing that around about ages 10 to 18, something like that. The other wonderful thing that's happening is that parents are having their children diagnosed and then they're reading up about autism and ADHD and going, oh, I think I might be autistic, or oh, I think I've lived my whole life with ADHD. And the wonderful thing about that is somebody gaining a sense of identity, being able to kind of let go of, I'm not a weirdo, I'm not strange, 
are these are people that have worked really hard all their lives to fit in? in so it's situations? an interesting point. There's been a few, I think, a number of public figures or people who have a story in the news, in the media somewhere, who talk about sort of discovering they are autistic or whatever, ADHD, yeah. as adults and sometimes you know, through the decades. Yeah. And um, yes, you usually get some um, background about how how helpful that can be to make sense of what who they are, their behaviours, their, their history, yeah. um, or at least maybe some of the trouble part of their history. Yeah, yeah. because if you you know if you're a person that has worked your whole life trying to fit in, you can see how things like depression could so easily become a part of who you are. It's hard work masking and camouflaging. It really is. It affects someone's well-being. All we want is for people to live their authentic lives, you know, to be themselves. And so people are able to share and they're going, oh, it's okay that I don't like going, I never liked going to the pub with my friends, it was always an ordeal. I don't like, I hate night clubbing, I'm not autistic, but, you know, now I go, you know what, I didn't have to like night clubbing, because it's just not part of who I am, and it's just like that for people when they're discovering that new part of themselves this neurodivergency and and they're saying, well actually it's just not part of my makeup to go um, out for drinks with my friends after work. My work day was enough for me and now I just want to go home and curl up with the cat. Mm -hmm. You know, and to be able to own that is a really wonderful thing. Um, why people, you know, ADHD people, they're like, man, I can't cook a meal, but far out, I did that jigsaw puzzle in two days. Mm -hmm. The, you know, the ability not to be able to focus and then the hyper focus over here when it's something that's giving them that intense dopamine hit, that pleasurable experience. So it answers a lot of questions for people and it truly is, you can see the light coming on in people's eyes again. And people, especially women who have been diagnosed with things like uh, bipolar or borderline personality disorder and all these different disorders, mm. and then when they finally get their autism diagnosis, they go, I'm not mentally unwell, mm. I'm just weird and that's okay. Mm. You know, I'm just part of these, this weird group of people, wonderfully weird group of people. Mm. So I um, get them in a room and it gets pretty interesting. You know, mm. My diversity and inclusion team at Scouts, we have uh, predominantly young people, and in that team, we have people who are uh, neurodiverse, uh, gender diverse, um, disabled, and all three at once. And so it is incredibly colourful, many of them have different colour hair as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's an incredibly colourful environment and they bring me some incredibly different thinking and attitudes and they're constantly challenging my middle age view on life and that has to be good, has to keep me young.